This conference will now be recorded. Okay, we'll call the meeting to order in consideration of this evening's agenda. If there are no changes, we'll move on to item number one, which is requests or comments from the public. If we do have any requests or comments this evening, please remember to state your name and address at the beginning of your comment. <clears throat> You'll have three minutes, and then toward the end, I'll give you a little signal to wrap it up. Yeah, the only comment I would have is on the agenda as published, number 10 is uh, being canceled. Okay. We, we, uh, the correspondence went out earlier today on that topic, and so the executive session is not necessary. Good evening, my name is Dave Johnson, Global Fire South, I'm the Sex Terrace. And uh, so uh, nobody really seems to know what's going on with that property up there where the, the hard rock is going to be. So I just wanted to kind of throw out there to the council that uh, a lot of people seem to think that a concert would be awesome there. And uh, I don't know if anybody's thought about it or anybody suggested it, but uh, that's the kind of cash register we need to uh, generate property tax right there. And it's something else that nobody else has in the area, like KCK, Sands Club, all that stuff. So it would be perfect location. And uh, so just want to throw that one out there. Thank you. Thanks. There are no other comments. We'll move on to item number two, which is consent <coughs> approval of the consent agenda item. Um, if you, if anybody would like either A or B removed for um, specific questions, we can uh, consider that and ask those now. Otherwise, I'll hear a motion to approve item number two. Mayor, I make a motion to approve item two A and B as presented. Second. We have a motion from Councilman Millett and a second from Councilman Shriver. Will the first please call up? Shriver. Yes. Scott. Yes. Adcock. Yes. Bishop. Yes. Millett. Yes. Shriver. Yes. 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 Item number three, consider selection of Gordon CPA as the city's auditor for the year ending in December 31st, 2023. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Council, what you have before you is the background information for the 2023 audit and the auditor selection which is staff is recommending Gordon CPA, that's Sean Gordon. We've worked with him since his company since 2019. The original contract was three years. And then the next two years are one year extension. This would be the last one year extension. And then we would go out for, for qualifications and bids uh, for the 2024 audit. So in a sense, we're keeping with the same, because the timing is pretty tough to go out for bids and do all that. We've been more than satisfied with their response and, and, the, and the methodology that they've used. We've been happy with their audits. Uh, there is a financial impact. It is about 11 plus percent in a change, but that, that is consistent what, with these two years extensions, they were a little more. Uh, partly it is that a little more uh, staffing will go into it with this partner and that sort of thing. So there's an added cost of just doing business. And that, so that moved from $11,150 to $12,460. But in the end, uh, staff would recommend with them be consistent with, with this particular audit go out in 2024 for requests for proposals. Uh, therefore, our recommendation is we stay with Gordon CPA for the amount of $12,460, and that's a not to exceed amount. Make a motion to consider selecting Gordon CPA as the city's auditor for the year ending December 31st, 2023. Second. We have a motion from Councilman Shriver, second from Councilman Adcox. Will the clerk please? Oh, sorry, I had is a that, question. Is that going to be uh, okay with uh, the budget that we approved two weeks ago? Is yeah. That be input yes, sir. It's not going to be impact that down. That was Any other 
Motion from Councilman Shriver, second from Councilman Adcock. Will the clerk please call roll? Shriver. Yes. Scott. Yes. Adcock. Yes. Bishop. Yes. Black. Yes. Number four is consider resolution 2023-10 regarding the gap waiver for 2023 audit. Mayor, thank you. Mayor Council, what you have before you is uh, the resolution 2023-10, uh, and this is the gap waiver. This is something we do annually. Uh, we, we are waiving ourselves out of the uh, general accepted accounting principles. It's because we're on a cash basis, and, and it essentially is cash exchanges is what we're auditing. So whether we take in money or distribute money in some way, payment of bills, that sort of thing. So this is a standard practice. We've been doing this for years. This is common for other municipalities as well. So we do recommend that you accept uh, resolution 2023-10 and adopt it as such. Is this new then, Mark? This gap waiver? Yeah. No, no, no. The, we do it, like I said, we do every this year? annually, every year. You, okay. We've done it for several, several okay. years. It's, it's, again, it's a common practice. Uh, statutory lawfully, lawful in the statutes, and we th th this accounting standard, uh, we are on a cash basis. So very simply, we're just auditing our cash exchanges. Okay. That's what it is. Make a motion we adopt resolution number 2023-10. Second. We have a motion from Councilman Bishop and a second from Councilman Scott. Will the clerk please call roll? Uh, I'm sorry, did you yeah. have a question? It was reverse, sorry. It, oh, I'm so sorry. For the note, that. sorry. I Bishop think it was, was the motion. Yes. Correct. Oh, Scott. sorry. Okay. okay. It's me. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm sorry, everybody. Okay. Good to check. <laughs> Will the clerk please call roll? Driver. Yes. Scott. Yes. Adcock. Yes. Bishop. Yes. Yes. Item number five on the agenda is consider resolution 2023-11, fixing the time and place for a hearing to determine if the structure at 10600 Cot Drive is dangerous, unsafe, or unfit for human habitation. <clears throat> Mayor, I'm going to have uh, Captain Jeff Short make a presentation on this. Uh, Madam Mayor and Council, uh, before you, you have um, resolution 2023-11, um, we're just going to set a date for a public hearing regarding a dangerous and unfit structure at 10600 Caw Drive. Um, the property itself has overgrown vegetation, a fallen tree on it, and numerous other code violations. Uh, city staff has conducted inspection of the structure and have deemed that there's multiple areas that are unfit and unsafe, and it's deemed as a fire hazard to the community. Um, after adopting a resolution to set the hearing, it would need to be published in the wine.echo to move forward and giving the uh, property owners notice and a, attempt to come to the hearing. Um, and um, that date for the hearing, it looks like it would be set for the 20, excuse me, the 13th of November here at City Hall. Has there been any conversation with the owners? Yes, actually, so we move forward with our process because of the plight of the property. We have a process in place. We didn't want to put our time frame on them. We wanted to put them on ours. They have been in good communication with our uh, community service officer, Tom Haas, and they are actually in the works of uh, obtaining the proper permits to move forward with the demolition of it. So I don't know actually that this will come to that because we're in good communication with them. I think that they're going to make the efforts to do it on their, on, on their own accord. Is what it sounds like so far. But we're going to move forward with our process, so we're not waiting on that. Thank you. I want to ask a question. It might be ridiculous, but I'm kind of ridiculous anyway. <laughs> but um, they mined a lot out of that. They they took a lot of excavation out of that. And I remember a few years back, we had uh, asked for mining fees for tonnage of money or tonnage of materials that were hauled out and that we were supposed to get as a city. Is there any record of us receiving any funds from that? Has it changed ownership since then? And 
So the, the, the asks are, do we have, if there was mining fees set, do, have we received any? Yes. And uh, I think that would be regardless of whoever the owner is. Who, whether yeah, it's now because, or you know, that happened about, probably about the same time that this mining fee thing, you remember that, the mining fees so. came up? Because I kind of laughed up here about who's going to figure out how much earth they're taking out of there, who's going to weigh it, you know, and how are we right. going to know that? <clears throat> but if it's there that we were supposed to receive it, I think we need to follow up on that and see if we can receive some of that money. Well, certainly, if we're charging any be some sort of formal agreement, you just need to take the time and, and I can get a report back to you as soon as I can. I'd like we just to, need to do the research on it. I'd like to see that because okay. we're so worried about money right now. I think anything that we're deserved, I think we deserve. So if I could ask for some kind of a report back on that. That's that's Mac and Annie still, isn't it? I don't know if they own it or not. But I was yeah. yeah, that would be the question. Who who, who owns, owns it now? It? Yeah. Sort of we'll do the research and I'll have the answers for you. But that's true. It definitely needs to be cleaned up. And what we're doing here, again, we're just setting the hearing. And they could come with the right paperwork and, and at that hearing. And be working. they're already working with us. No different than the other folks we talked about last time. So we're just setting the hearing. Where, as as it was stated, we're, we're working on our time because we do sometimes have people who retract their kind of formal handshake agreements and things like that. So stay on our time. We're not behind, uh, you know, when we, when we're starting the process. Well, there might have been a resolution or ordinance or something to the effect oh, of certain they yeah. got to pay some money to take out of there. But just a thought. I'll make the motion to adopt resolution number 2023-11, setting the public hearing for November 13th, 2023, on or after 6 p.m. Second. Does anyone else have a question? We have a motion from Councilman Bishop and a second from Councilman Shriver. Will the clerk please call them? Shriver. Yes. Scott. Yes. Yes. Bishop. Yes. 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 Item number six, consider a request for a change order in the amount of $14,099.87 to add guardrails to the 102nd Street Culvert Replacement Project. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'll call on uh, Director Goodall to present the information. Uh, Mayor and Council, you have before you change order number one for the 102nd Street Culvert Replacement. <clears throat> this change order comes from just a safety concern. Uh, the original design of that was going to be a wider shoulder on the east side, uh, and that was previous administration had talked with our engineer about that to stay away from a guardrail. But upon visiting the site, there's about a 20 to 30 foot drop off on that east side. Um, I think a guardrail is definitely needed there. Um, we actually have a culvert box on the west side also that would benefit from some protection from a guardrail. So we've come back with a uh, change order for a guardrail installation. Uh, it still will come from the same fund, drop that balance down to 303675 but the total for the guardrail is $14,099.87. We would recommend approval. Is that a guardrail on both sides? Yes. And what type of guardrail is it? It'd just be a standard guardrail, metal guardrail. Like metal. Yeah. Madam Mayor, Council, if there's no other questions, um, make a motion to approve the installation of the guardrails by Legacy Underground Construction, LLC, in the amount of $14,099.87. Second. I did have one quick question on the guardrail. Um, I know you said it was a previous administration that kind of kept that off of the, the um, design. design. Yeah. Um, did the other bids that we received from different contractors include guardrails in their bids? No, they were all bids specifically off of the design engineer, and it, it all had that wider <clears throat> shoulder, and that was it. Thank you. So the background there is that's a four-to-one slope and not a wide shoulder. So based on that slope design, it is they, they you're not required to install guardrails if you design it and build it to that standard. So therefore... The four to one slope, build that out. You don't have to add $14,000 with the guardrails, that sort of thing. Uh, however, it wasn't built to that four to one slope. That was going to be a, a difficult construction maneuver. I don't know if it's just legacy or would have been that difficult based on the terrain and just all the angles of things and how it's all come together. So there was somewhat of a field change where then we installed, if you haven't been there, we installed about four or five, six foot wide 
uh, shoulder, but there's still a, a pretty good drop off where that uh, discharge tube is. And so we thought in the field that this was the best way to handle it. And if you just simply look at it, common sense would tell you this is easy money spent in the sense of it's safety. Safety. You have on the west side, you have a concrete block that wasn't there before. You run off that road on slip time or something, you're going to hit something pretty hard, uh, non-movable. You know, so we just think it's a good safety measure. So, again, that design by by standard eliminates the need technically for the guardrails. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other questions? We have a motion from Councilman Scott and a second from Councilman Mallott. Will the clerk please call roll? Schreiber. Yes. Scott. Yes. Yes. Bishop. Yes. Mallott. Yes. Okay. Item seven, consider a request for a change order in the amount of $15,810.56 for additional reasonable and necessary construction related work completed by the contractor beyond the original scope of work on 102nd Street culvert replacement project. Mayor, I'll again call on. Uh... Director Goodall to present this one as well. Uh, Mayor Council, we have a board to change order number two on 102nd Street Culver replacement. Uh, this change order comes mostly from a waterline conflict that we had in the past few weeks. Uh, we came to site, we had it marked, was not located where everyone thought it was because it was a 45 degree angle on where the waterline tip off is supposed to be. Well, um, in engineering, 45 degrees side or down and everybody thought it went to the side it didn't it went down under and uh, it was actually in conflict with our elevation going into the lagoon so they had to locate that line legacy tried to assist dcu in moving along with it they actually dug out around the line tried to get good prep for them because they were going to do a couple of days to get there trying to keep them from being delayed too long dcu finally showed up they did relocate the line but <coughs> They had some insist or some added expenses as far as labor, just going up and not getting the job done. Longer time they had their equipment, uh, more materials. Uh, they actually ended up having to over dig the road to the side of the water line, how far that is up. Could have been more repair on the road. Uh, they did come back with a, a much larger initial change order that we negotiated down more than 50%. Uh, so, I mean, I feel like these are actually expenses that were incurred. Uh, we also did talk with DCU as far as what their policies are. DCU's policy is that if it is a road reconstruction, they are responsible for relocating their line in the right of way. If it is a sewer line or a stormwater line project, they are they do not afford those costs. So I don't know if that's a discussion down the road, but that's where we are assisting. So we do feel like these are expenses that were incurred and should be paid to legacy. Uh, before, I'm sorry, I just have a comment, maybe a question. Would you be so kind as to check our agreement contract with BPU to see how that is written? And I, thank you for, thank you for. I actually had a meeting with BPU for future projects after this had occurred. They, yep. they sent it to us from there, so I, I don't have any writing, but we can definitely ask for it. Yeah, I think their correspondence was to kind of give us the gist of what their policy is, how they how they particularly operate on these construction projects. And, and, and I think CE has addressed it, which is depending on which kind of project it is, is what they're going to be responsible for. Right. Thank you for negotiating that down, too. But, you know, if you could see what the yeah. contract is. CE, um, <clears throat> did you say that, that they, when you were talking about the water sewer in uh, – Stormwater, did you say that when they're re relocating the water line that they're responsible for it? They are, they are not responsible for it. It is a stormwater project or a sewer line. Oh, a stormwater project. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. Okay. All right. Um, I did have a question about there was a difference in the length of the project from where it started or where it was bid to where it ended up. Who changed the design length of the project? So, in which of that yeah, and I, change I, made? Okay, I do think CE described what what happened. Is it starts with the BPU line and what our type of project is, which is the stormwater, and what what happened 
based on uh, digging out the line, moving the line, making the adjustments and all that. It added some length to the road uh, resurfacing or replacement, as well as the thickness of the concrete. So there was two costs in there. The longer it is, of course, it's gonna cost more, and the thickness that they had to put in to put the crown of that road in. If you've been there, you, it's pretty distinct the way they had to do it to get that, to ensure that the flow went east and west. And CE, you might have some additional on that as well, or no? The only other thing was that uh, Legacy did bed that line with rock, uh, of course, you need to have it. So uh, that's an additional cost that they required from the project. Could you tell me the original bid and then what we're actually going to end up at for this project? Yeah, uh, CE, you know the exact, it was 84,000 or 81,000 plus. Oh, it was 81,259.59.50. And then by the time we paid the two change orders, if you will, adding the guardrails, which believe me, I, I, I think they should have been bid in there originally, but here and there. And then uh, paying this particular change order, which is work they really did and needed to be done, uh, we're down the balance of that particular uh, fund will be 287865 and 7 cents. So what would the 81, I'm sorry, what was the 81,000 change to? 30, change so about yeah, 30, between the two. Mm -hmm. 30, I guess I'm confused because before the Culver project started, locates were done, including water lines for BPU, correct? I mean, wouldn't there, wouldn't there original? So did BPU do the original locates, or was it no. by another locate company? Because what? Which does bring that into question. You know, I think they just looked at the plans and markets. They didn't go out there and locate the line. Well, that it somehow makes us responsible for their, <clears throat> their inaccuracy on their locate. That's, I mean, they bid the project, you know, after seeing the locates, but I don't know. I have a little bit of a hard time with this one. I agree with Nelson and Scott. I wonder if we should be talking to that third party to see if they would like to um, assist in some of the overage fees since it was a lot due to their lack of diligence. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. I think some investigation is going to be necessary as to where said blame lies and whether or not there is not some language and some agreement somewhere that they are not held responsible for some of these things. So we're going to have to do some digging for sure. They usually, on, if BPU didn't do the locates, you know, if that, if that is a UCC, I can't USIC. remember that. USIC. Huh? USIC. Yeah, there you USIC, go. Yeah. So if that locate company does it, they have a do not exceed, you know, plus or minus three or four or five feet. And it sounds like two feet on this one. Well, it sounds like they were, they missed it completely. Uh, That's a challenge. Prior to. Okay. So yeah. I, I don't know if we can say anything there. They did dislocate. But typically, the only way you go back on them is if they dislocate and they're outside of your location and you bid a lot. So, on them. so you said locates were done after the bid was? And that's typical. Yeah, we, we bid out the project by the design, and then the, the uh, contractor will call in and locate so we can yeah. see everything at that point. Then, so that the locator was hired by the contractors, not by the well, city? They called it in. They aren't really hired. Yeah, so it's just a third party that everybody uses. So it's just yeah. it's a free service. Yeah, it's free. It's, it's a free service, and actually it's the law. Yeah. But I have, have I've ran yeah. into this before. We were digging footings or something like that, and we come across a pipe. We didn't, this particular one we didn't hit, but we scraped it, and it was within their two feet. Mm -hmm. And USIC ended up paying for us to relocate that line because it was in their two feet. So I think looking, you know, getting with them, you know, that, that if they mislocated, it's their fault, you know. But I think you don't I, hit it. I think, and I agree with you too, but I think the point is what he's trying to say is that 
the bid was given, then the locates were done, and then and then those locates were wrong, you know, which they had to make that change. So I was I was kind of hoping that they did locate first, but that doesn't sound like case. No, you'd never do that. Yeah. You, I think the order does matter. Yeah, so. it does. This contractor did do that work. He did the work. Dug, he did. dug and dug apparently to to no to no end, and then finally they discovered that I think uh, Goodall, Mr. Goodall, said it that it went down, and then. It, but there was some indication from the paperwork that it did cross the street, and that was that's not accurate. And then, then what engages here is they're trying to find it. The next piece is now all the movement parts, right? They had to get BPU. They helped dig that. They helped replace all of it in some way because BPU doesn't do some of that work, so the contractor is responsible. Put it in rock, do all these things, and that did add some costs. And again, they felt their cost was extremely higher. Now. If there's no confidence in, in this particular number, we can do the investigate. We don't have to prove this now. It took us a long time over, over several weeks here to negotiate because we were not comfortable in some of the other added costs, machinery sitting around charge, you know, uh, send, send our labor home kind of thing because BPU didn't connect the line right or, or mm -hmm. these kinds of things. So there are some other things that are impacting it, but in a sense, we, we narrowed this down to what work they actually did and they expended this particular money. Now we can go back and investigate who might be somewhat responsible for that uh, in the sense, but I think the order does matter. They bid this job without the mm -hmm. locates, they called in the locate service and somewhere they got it wrong. I, I yeah. do think that the mislocate does not impact if this is going to happen. Usually on a mislocate, it's because they mislocated it and hit the line. They mislocated it, but that line was still going to be where it was. Mm -hmm. and I don't know that you're going to get them to say that their their fault caused this because that was already the conflict, regardless if they mislocated it or not. If they had mislocated it and they would have dug into the water line, that's different. Then that's different. It sounds like it sounds like they did the work above and beyond, the extra concrete, the extra length, and then you did your due diligence trying to get the price down. Yeah. You know, give us your exact costs. I feel very comfortable with these are what they expended out there. Yeah. And I, I just don't know that we'll I mean, we can definitely check with USIC if we want. I just don't think that's the I, I, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so either. Well, it doesn't hurt. No, exactly. I'm, I'm not saying we can't. But right. We definitely can check with them. But I just don't know that it will. Really I just yeah, think the water line was in conflict regardless of their work. Mm -hmm. Would you guys... Um, Want to move forward with this, or do you want to table it and get more information? Oh, what is there a legal opinion on recourse or action? Or, I mean, we need to pay the people, but is it going to hurt us if we don't pay them now? You know, is it okay for them to wait to get their money? Or, I mean, it sounds like CE's done his due diligence on that. You've negotiated it down quite a bit, but it started at thirty-four thousand. And you cut it basically to in half. Yeah, we got a little yes. about 55%. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to pay this and then and then get do a little bit more diligent, yeah, yeah, diligent yeah. service on our there, there is some language for I'm sorry, for the for the change order part of this that the city can consider some of these reasonable requests for, for change for some unknown uh, challenge to to the project that, that cost them some money to do it within the standards, right? Mm -hmm. So that language does exist. We looked at that. Uh, we didn't think, as you, as you see, we have a $15,000 request here, but their request was Much twice more. in the sense, so we didn't think those were reasonable charges. Mm -hmm. and, and so we've gotten down to, okay, we can, we believe this is good intent here, that you've gone out, you've done the work, you've mm -hmm. done it to this standard, and we're not paying for idle time and labor that, you know, they didn't move from that project, the overhead and all this other stuff. So we, we just washed that out. But there is some legal uh, verbiage that we operated under that gives us the discretion, if you will, yeah. to, to look at this and make a decision. And that's why it's before you now. We, you, you've heard Director Goodall. Uh, we, we've talked with these folks extensively about you know, what it was. We didn't feel the first request was even reasonable. 
So we think we've gotten it down to this part here. Now, do we owe these <coughs> folks this money? That would be the legal question, right? Do we it's, But did they do it in good faith, good effort? We, I think the answer that CE and I would give you is yes. And uh, they've been reasonable to work with. But maybe we do have some protections legally if you want to consider that. And we could, we could still table this and come back. They, uh, we've been in several days of negotiation to get it here. So what's, what's, a, what's another couple of weeks? There's no emergency here. The project is 92% without the guardrails done, right? So we're, we're, we're still engaged with them. So uh, we, can, we can do that, have the legal paperwork looked at uh, uh, and, and go from there. Or we can really hone down if you'd like more of a, uh, a detailed what we said yes to. There's an option as well. So you, you do have that option to table this matter, and we can bring it to you another time. Do we have other work with the Legs Underground scheduled coming up? Uh, no, sir, we don't. This was the project that we uh, they, we awarded the bid on. Yeah. Uh, there are drainage-related uh, projects that they're interested in with okay. the city. Uh, they seem to be they, – their work was – Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, you know, they were good to work with people that doesn't mean we give them give them bids they yeah. don't have to be competitive but uh, i think they're very interested in working for us again so well they can oh go ahead good their initial bid was forty thousand dollars plus hundred that's that's what i was wondering too yeah so, i mean they were very very <clears interested <clears <throat> with, and if this water line conflict had to come up they were going to be right on it. yeah i mean so this water line property water line conflict is the only thing that's really elevated their cost yeah and then the guardrails were just an extra that, that we was needed an extra that i think yeah. new administration what do you think pay it mayor i want to make a motion that pay we it. pay them uh change order number two that we uh remit payment to fifteen thousand eight hundred and ten fifty six to legacy would you uh consider making a part of that motion because that would be uh, uh subject to final legal review of the release document Sure. Can we send my motion to table the item until the October 8th meeting and bring back legal? Well, no, I think that you can make the motion to pay, but it would be well, yeah, but if you can negotiate it down $10,000 more, that might even be a better <laughs> way to do it. Motion to table till October 8th and get some more verbiage from the city attorney and city manager. Second. I think it's October. It's a Sunday. Sunday. Yeah, it's ninth. Ninth. Yeah. October 9th. Ninth. Okay. Any other questions? All right. We have a motion from Councilman Mallott, a second from Councilman Adcox. Will the clerk please call roll? Driver. Yes. Scott. Yes. Adcox. Yes. Bishop. Yes. Mallott. Yes. Yes. Mallott. Yes. Mallott. Yes. Mallott. Yes. Item number eight, consider authorizing payment of $19,901.07 to Union Bank and Trust to cover outstanding 2023 vehicle purchase costs. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Mayor Council, what you have before you is the background describing kind of what the, <coughs> what the issue uh, is, was. Uh, in a sense, we, we, we lease payment vehicles. We pay them annually. Uh, we've had delays after delays of vehicles on order and that sort of thing. So what happened here from all indications is that a bill of about 13,000 plus was paid to an escrow account that was actually slated for these most current vehicles to be paid from, okay? So, and those current vehicles, they have about a 2,200 uh, added cost than the 18 months prior. So the, the cost has risen, inflation, that sort of thing. And so the cost of purchasing and outfitting for each one of those is about 2,200 bucks a piece. So we're about 6,600 bucks plus another 1,300 plus. That is the $19,000, uh, let me give you the exact, 19,901 and seven cents. That's outstanding that we need to pay to the escrow so that the, the latest vendor can be completely made whole and paid out. So that, that's essentially what's happened here is there's been overpayments to an escrow in which payments shouldn't have gone there they were for previous vehicles and they should have gone to another account and they did it. So we're correcting somewhat of an error and getting it paid. Well, we didn't lose that money that we paid there. It went to the escrow, right? Went to the escrow. Okay. And what happens is that escrow takes that in yeah. and they pay the checks out to, to the vendor. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And 
which vehicles are they used for? Uh, the particular ones we're paying is the ones we financed for 164,211, and that in the end will be they've changed from Ford to Dodge SUVs. Okay. And before long, we'll be financing, self-financing some of those. Do you know when that'll Well, start? I wouldn't, yes, in the future. We, I think, you know, you're talking about that capital reserve fund that we created. Uh, and so essentially, it's that is not funded yet. We anticipate selling any vehicles, that sort of stuff, and then parking that money to see that particular end. And then we need to start thinking about how we're going to then replenish that fund as an annual transfer or that, hey, we're, we're going to put $100,000 in there on a, on a regular basis to get ready for these expenses because we won't be ready for them probably in the next 24 months until we do make some budgetary decisions. <clears throat> you got to pay the bills, make a motion to authorize payment of 19901070 to Union Bank and Trust to satisfy an outstanding balance related to vehicle purposes. Second. We have a motion from Councilman Mollett and a second from Councilman Bishop. Will the clerk please call roll? Treasurer. Yes. Scott. Yes. Adcock. Yes. Bishop. Yes. Mollett. Yes. <clears throat> Item number nine, consider amending resolution 2023-09 to extend the publishing dates and hearing date due to mispublication by the publisher. Uh, Mayor, thank you. Mayor, Council, uh, I apologize for the confusion. I had several asks about this looked like the same one from, from earlier today. But this is the resolution that we passed two weeks ago uh, to set a public hearing. Now, in, under these particular uh, situations, these unfit or dangerous structures, when we set the hearing date, we have to publish it consecutively, one week and then the next week. So those instructions were sent to the publisher. However, in error, they didn't publish a second time. Therefore, we have to revisit it. And staff is recommending the amendment of section one and section two, as you can read there, of, of the resolution already passed 2023-09. It sets the hearing date and those other dates as well. And they do align with the one we just did tonight. They're the same dates. Is there gonna be an extra fee in this? For who? For, for us. us. For us, I don't know. I don't think they're gonna charge us again. I okay. <laughs> Where's it at? I'll make the motion to approve resolution number 202309 for the date to be. We're uh, amending the dates. Amending the dates to. Section the, one, section yeah, two. section one and section two. There we go. Good. Second. We have a motion from Councilman Bishop and a second from Councilman Mallott. Will the clerk please call roll? Schreiber. Yes. Scott. Yes. Adcock. Yes. Bishop. Yes. Yes. Okay. Item number 10 on the agenda is no longer needed, so Correct. we will move on to item number 11, the city manager report. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Mayor Council, uh, I do have some housekeeping for you. Uh, we do have candidate interviews, and you will be assembling, and in a sense, it's a special meeting. Therefore, uh, I have with me, it takes... The special meeting or the call to the special meeting takes three council members request to the mayor to set that meeting. That meeting will be set for tomorrow. Uh, you will uh, essentially, should you sign these, three of you sign these uh, documents, we'll have a special meeting. You'll assemble in here, call the meeting to order and as a regular session and you'll immediately uh, recess into executive session. Now uh, that, that will go, that will repeat itself on a regular basis. In other words, for every candidate that you have, you have, the, you have the duration, you have the persons who are going to be invited to that meeting, and, and you'll, you'll adjourn to that 670 to the training room, uh, I'm sorry, recess to it. Then you'll come back out and go back into open session. On the recess and on the return, the city clerk will need to be present, but not in the room with you at the executive session. And again, each candidate's name will have to be, that's the person that needs to be invited and anybody else you want to invite. But it's essentially the same way we do any other 
uh, executive sessions. So if you keep that process in mind, and, and uh, Chantal will be here to help kind of guide you along. But we have to have a formal record of that. And again, the duration and all the things that you do before. So I have, I have three documents. And Mayor, do you want me to hand those out to any volunteers, or would you like to do it, or? Yeah, either way. If you okay. There's this three folks, uh, council people, want to uh, be the requester of the special session. One. Good. And the uh, city clerk will attest those uh, once they're signed and after the meeting ends. But in a sense, we'll start it right at 12:30. Do I understand the? the <coughs> I believe those might have been adjusted. I think it's 1:45. I think it was adjusted, wasn't it? Okay, I don't. I don't know that. So we should probably say that right now. Let me. Yeah. Check Can you email, confirm? Because I think there was some candidate. I think it's. I think it's 1:45. Is that that's when it first starts? So if we want to just symbol uh, just a couple minutes early of that, you can go right in for your duration. Again, if you or one thirty, if you say an hour and a half, remember it's easier to come back out and go back in. But if you say an hour and a half, you're you're somewhat uh, uh, committed to an hour and a half, for example. So uh, depending on how they're scheduled, you should stick with that schedule the best you can. Any other questions, comments regarding the special meeting? Do we have three signatures? Good, excellent. So we will, Mary, you'll call a special meeting for approximately 135 ish tomorrow. Yeah. To start. This is 145 and interview start. So I think that she'll meet with us prior, and then we'll probably start that initial one right at 2. So we'll start the meeting at 145. Okay, 145. For the record, excellent. Uh, congratulations are in order to uh, for the city. If we can move on, is that fine? Uh, the yes. phase one of 98th Street was let, and the bids were awarded. The bid to Mac and Annie Construction. We anticipated that being 3.6 million dollars. Our share, our share is 1,536,000 dollars. Nice. So that. Now, remember what we were fighting is the inflation. So th those things, from what we can understand, the supplies and some of this other stuff that was really impacting some of these construction projects has stabilized. And so now they're getting an easier, better picture of what these costs are going to be. This uh, McEnany, uh, I think, appreciates this being somewhat of a year-long project. Remember, we're going to try to, uh, they're required to keep access open as much as they can. Uh, there'll be short periods of road closures when it, it's necessary, but they're going to be doing all the, some of the communication, the PR work on that sort of stuff. So what this means to us is we're in somewhat of a, of, of a, of a hurry up, okay? We don't have $1.5 million. We do what we don't. So in a sense, what we are going to do is temporary notes is, our, is the full suggestion, and I agree with that suggestion, and that we have to have all of this in place by November 8th for a November 9th payment, okay? Now, in a sense, uh, we, we have a schedule that includes October 9th, and then the meeting right after that, we have some things that the governing body must do in the, as that part of the process. We wanna give us enough time to then, once we issue those temporary notes, that the transcript is delivered to the Attorney General's office for review so that we can have the money and make the payment on November 9th. And why that's so important is, at this point, there's not much flexibility in when we owe the money. Okay, so we need to secure the funds so we can make that payment so we don't lose the, the matching funds. So that's a $5.6 million project that we're gonna spend just that 1.5 million, a little over that. But this is a really good deal and we're just really happy about that. So now we need to talk about, any questions or comments on that? There will be a schedule. We're gonna be on this, this will be a priority because of the time frame to get this money secured, okay? Uh, we don't wanna capitalize the interest payment, meaning roll it into the note. We won't, don't wanna do that. It's 187,000 plus at this point for that payment. We have capacity, it's close, but there's still capacity. We'll have a fund balance in our debt service. It will remain. But in 2025, we've, that, that debt payment falls from over 800,000 
to around that 650,000. So right there, we have some really good capacity, so we'll be able to easily absorb that payment. It's gonna be a little closer uh, in this kind of first uh, payment in 2024. The loan would, would be easier made if we're committed to having one payment, principal and interest in 2024. It's, they're just more eager to, to make the loan. We don't want it, we're gonna issue temporary notes, unless you tell me something different, uh, the, our expectation is temporary notes were better off because some of these projects have some flexibility in their kind of this. Well, you just seen a change order of, you know, had we paid the full price, it's 30000 above on an $81,000 project or something, right? So these things do happen. And so we want to have the flexibility of the temporary notes that we come in a little short or a little long in some way and that we're able to uh, essentially capitalize on that <laughs> money and use it best to these projects. So... A two-year temporary note or less actually has a higher interest rate, so we're better off at that four-year period. Okay? Four years is important because it puts us 27 and out. What that means is phase two of 98th Street and our potential bonding. It also means this as well. We've talked about Richland Avenue and we've talked about Kansas Avenue. Okay, Right now, one of them is a little longer, but it's easier to do. One of them has lots more complications, but a little shorter. So in the end, when we look at the high level of the cost of these projects from a really high view, they're about 1.8 million a piece. And that's a little heavy on the heavy. Uh, it's not conservative because we just don't know. And in the sense that we should be looking at temporary note for the 98th Street, which we know it's we know what the cost that is. We should temporary note for a four-year period-ish for the Kansas Avenue project and the Richland project. Now, what we won't uh, pay in that Richland project, we already have money for the drainage systems. We just mentioned Legacy, for example. You just did one on a second. That would be our next stage for that. We have the money for that particular piece. But really what it comes down to is how do we want to design the road? And... We can design it to be a great big looking highway, uh, but we have conferred with our city engineer. Uh, CE and I have studied on this, and we appreciate the curb and gutters and all of that, especially on Richland. However, we think we can scale back and do more, use our money the best, and have a 12 to 14 year road that you can be proud of as long as you maintain it, right? Now, we fixed the water problem on Richland, I think we're smooth sailing, but what no one has considered is the hill on 106. See, these are connectors. If you look at Shawnee coming from Edwardsville 110th, comes, come, come back to the east, go down 106, that's a failing road too. So why wouldn't you finish your connector to all the way to Richland Avenue, all the way to 102nd, which has already been improved. So that's a whole sector that we can do to be a, 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 a connector road that is would be well done. We can do it all with this with this money. Now, could it mean pulverize in place, full depth uh, replacement? <clears throat> Certainly. But remember, I know that the Richland is one of our priorities, and I, I appreciate that because it's a failing road for sure. But part of we sent a lot of traffic down there which had never been there before, right? And on a consistent basis, two times. So what we have is a lot of feedback that says this road needs complete attention. Is that right? So in the sense that we kind of designed it to be this road that might go through uh, to the west all the way through the property. There's a pond behind there. But that is something 30 years plus. I say not do it right for right now, but do it for the immediate future, that 10 to 12, 15 year road that we bond <clears throat> through temporary notes now and get ready by summer to ensure that we're doing the 98th Street and we're doing the Richland and we're looking heavily at the Kansas Avenue. So the construction of the road, I think we have opportunity to scale that back, to do more with other roads, touch as many as we can, and get these connectors all ready to go without having so much of the uh, kind of <coughs> the expense that's really heavy, by the way, of running the curb and those guttering systems. And the reason why we're gonna improve the drainage we're going to do that. 
And so that should help this road hold up. And again, remember all those people went by there and they said it was a terrible road, but on a daily basis, there's under 100 cars a day through that road. So, but if we touch more of them with the same money, uh, I think what you'll see is something tangible has happened to the streets. Something that people can see, here's this and here's that. And we still get a quality road, okay? Kansas Avenue has a little bit of uh, challenge to it in the sense that it's misaligned with the right-of-ways. That's the best way to say it, in that when they built it, as Mr. Bishop pointed out, it's a straight road. However, the property kind of, the road goes over a right-of-way and does some, some, some different things. We have to make some adjustments there right away. We need to figure out where the right of way is going to be and the road's going to be so we know where to put the utilities. So there is some work that we need to do prep just to get there. But that road also is about $1.8 million by the time you put all the investment in it that, that needs to be done. Now, what kind of road do we want to build there? And are there some other things? Uh, I, know we're, I know there is some concern of uh, Mr. Bishop and his neighbors as well that it's already heavily trafficked for that kind of road now because we have that, that event center, the Hollis Center down there. So it drives more than the residential traffic, right? And so even, even without a traffic count, it gets more than usual. And therefore, are we, we're gonna worry about the speeds and things and how do we wanna design that road? And so I think on a kind of a heavy foot on the, on the uh, budget of that particular road, 1.8 million, and the other, Richland to include the 106th connector all together, another 108 million. So what we're anticipating is that we have the capacity uh, to pay for that, about 187,000 as the payment in 2024, maybe more, we gotta do the, the final numbers. But I think what we do is we fund all of that through the temporary note, and then we then change that temporary note when phase two of 98th Street is let and we turn it into we sell the bonds we turn, we we convert temporary into a bond sale and interest rates are expected to be much better uh, the the amount of money helps in what we're doing and in the sense of how much it's going to cost us to have that uh, note and things like that so that as pretty high level view of what kind of we're moving towards no matter all of that we have to focus on at least the 1.5 million plus for the KDOT project. That's kind of small potatoes in the bond market. Okay, that's that's not. It, it sounds like a whole lot of money. It certainly does to me. But in the sense of how we want to finance these projects and the timing, <clears throat> by the time we're ready in four years, if we do these and have this money, and hopefully we come out better ahead when we get the actual cost to Kansas Avenue. 106 all the way down to Ridgeland that we're in a better position. And there will be money in the sense that maybe we can touch some other roads as well. And we should know that, especially when we get the hard, the, the really the hard figures to those projects. Again, these are all dependent on what you decide, the level of road that you want to build. So I think this is the funding mechanism piece that, that staff needs to go forward with. Again, I've, it comes down to, we definitely need to do the, the DOT project for sure. I, th I just think the timing is really good for us. And so I will yield to any discussion, Mayor, and uh, however you direct me. Um, well, I did a little bit of research. I've had uh, residents calling me pretty consistently about Kansas Avenue since we had decided um, early in the spring to address that in 2023. And so when I was digging, I found the um, Hot shot where it said for speaker road we've dedicated one hundred thirty thousand dollars to that. Okay. Second Street forty thousand dollars to that from this year's budget. Richland we had two hundred twenty five thousand to that. In Kansas we had one hundred sixty thousand dedicated to that. So I guess my question would be on especially the Richland and the Kansas Avenue. Is that money still going to be earmarked <laughs> and ready to go towards those projects, or are we, is there anything we're doing this year? to address those with those funds? Yeah, and those are good questions because it's 190,000 for all the pre-construction, the survey, all the engineering, and uh, for both of those, they're so very similar that the engineering is about the same cost as well as the build cost, just at that high level view, uh, just because again, one's more complex, one's longer, one's shorter, that sort of thing. But in the sense, it, it really depends on 
what's not clear is where this money is coming from. And I just got to go back and, and, and some of these are designated in street and drainage. Okay, that, that may be a bonded uh, fund that we have, 729 for example, it says street and drainage or something, right? It, so when you look at that, there's not really a project list that I can find associated, but I'm presuming that there are already funds that are ready to pay for the, uh, the initial, like the pre-construction, the surveying, where we're gonna put the road and stuff, and we've been getting those bills in, I could tell that much. And so I'll, I'll research that a little more but in the sense, this would be a part of those costs. So right now, from, from what I can tell from uh, these sheets that I was given, uh, there isn't too many, uh, there isn't, this is about clearing and grubbing, uh, storm pipes, all of that other stuff, not the pre-construction stuff. So I'm, 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 I'm almost presuming that this set aside money is for those things and this bid of 1.8 or just a high level overview of a cost of the road is not going to include those things. So this would probably be the build cost and this would be the surveying engineering cost. Okay. okay. And, and I can, I'll send that to you so you can see like it has a description in what was included. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure that since we had money set aside for that, that it didn't, um, dissipate into right. uh, general funds or, or something else that we were addressing the streets that we set out to. Um, I also wanted to know, I, and you probably have looked into this or might, might intend to, I know everything's been really busy, but there's a lot, um, billions of federal dollars set aside specifically for infrastructure. And a lot of that might be applicable to stormwater in our city. And so I wonder if there might be any grant funding that we could apply to the state to help with these costs. Yeah, um, there are programs, yes. But unfortunately, that doesn't, yeah, in, in time, it would certainly, uh, timing really is the key here, unfortunately. And it's, it's on me, just like it's quickly on you. It's like, hey guys, what do you wanna do, you know? So, so this thing is just, they just awarded this bid and now we're talking about how best to finance things. So like the infrastructure and some of this other stuff, maybe, uh, I know it was presented, uh, Mr. Malott suggested that we need to address stormwater in the old town and that the, the sewer and, you know, ARPA could be related, but that wouldn't even touch that project. It's just so expensive. And thus this may be some of that, that, that looks to the future and or could we combine because remember if we fund these construction road construction projects we'd then be able to redesignate them to other road construction projects so if there's if somehow we look in the next year or so that these particular uh infrastructure monies are available through granting or whatever we could still probably use them and they'll have a surplus in these other accounts and then which we can redesignate to say, hey, we're gonna repair Second Street or High Street or something else. So that, that, that's always possible. We're just issuing temporary notes that will have this cash in this account and that we're designated to spend it on these road projects. And therefore, like, like we understood in the, the building acquisition, acquisition, we know legally, we just have to redefine these, send a script to the attorney general, have it approved, and then we can use the money for other purposes. So I think there's our kind of our saving grace, if you will. Any direction. I know there's there is a schedule. It's quick. You're going to see a couple things before you on the ninth, and then again, uh, remind me the twenty something uh, meeting. That calendar is a long way away for fifty-two yeah. year old eyes. So <laughs> without their glasses. Twenty third. Twenty third. Okay. Yeah. So we will have a couple of things there. We have asked KDOT today to extend one more week because that ninth is a very hard timeline. Um, what I'll plan to do is, they haven't responded on the KDOT thing, I'm hoping they will. It's just give us a little more buffer because the obstacle here to meeting the deadline is really the Attorney General's office reviewing the, the easy script and putting their stamp on it. But as government goes, government goes slow. So. Uh, to miss any deadlines and we don't want to give up these STP funds mm -hmm. that we were awarded on this project. I mean, the government's paying quite a bit of money for this, this project. So and how long do we have to decide before the you, STP? Because it's a, a lot of information tonight. It is a lot of, that's why I'm briefing you now and we will start with the schedule 
uh, we will get all of the financing package together and then we'll start to really talk about that by the ninth. that we'll have some formal discussions I'll I'll try not to overly communicate it too much but as things really evolve I want you to be abreast of these things because some important decisions have to be made and it's by the time you get to the end of the October you really don't have much time to table it we'd have to have a special meeting between then and the ninth. And, we, and these things need to keep rolling because they are on a full time. So what I'm going to do, unless there's an absolute no, we're going to package these projects up as one piece and these designations for this amount of money, and then we'll see what that looks like, and you'll be able to tell what the payment's going to be and how it impacts our debt services, right? That debt service is the one you have 10.4 mils assigned to, okay? Would that be okay if I proceed that way? And uh, we'll get we'll get our expertise from uh, Piper Sandler. There are financial advisors, and we have our bond attorney already engaged. So we think we can hit this timeline. I think that'd be helpful to me yep. to know the full picture of what the request is. Yep. I will do it. Let's see. Is there anything? Let me look at my pack stack here so I don't forget. Uh, uh, thank you to. Uh, our great employees who worked on the festival, they got kind of handed off, you know, and between employees going and coming and that sort of thing. But uh, Brenda and Elizabeth <coughs> did a terrific job with what they were handed, and, and it was a good thing they were apprised of the of the project early on. Uh, we did we did end up with some good sponsorships. It was it, the whole year has been down somewhat in that area. Uh, the volunteerism we just simply didn't have it, but they really stepped up. As you notice, we had approved a beer garden for the project, but the Chamber of Commerce was going different directions and it really didn't communicate well, so they didn't have that piece of it. I don't know if we missed it or not. They did pay us a, a vendor fee as somewhat of a donation, and, and we were able to uh, offset some of the cost. Uh, the city uh, contributes about $6,000 to Autumn Fest, and uh, they, 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 they did well with the money. I, I just really appreciate what they've done. And, uh, we gave them a couple of gift cards for all their work, and, and uh, they handled it. Really, they just really, we, we're in good hands of next year, and the, and the coordination, they're ready to go. They already have it mapped out and everything, so uh, good job to them. And Mayor, I think that is it. Oh, city Attorney. Now let's get it. I just want to follow up on last meeting. Uh, if this is a separate agenda item for a future meeting, that's fine. But I had talked some about the possibility of seeking an attorney general opinion about the nature of the city council mayor um, uh, roles in the budget and other ordinance processes. I didn't know if there was direction from the council of me actually wanting me to reach out or if that was just I kind of left it as that's an option but nothing was really decided so at least wanted to bring that up again and because that would take some time to have the court their interest so to speak but since there is a previous attorney general opinion from the 1980s that I think it, it, there's a precedent for the attorney general opining on such things would take it, but it's, it's something I could do if that's really what you want. Yes. Yes. I've asked for it three or four times. Or for me? To the city. I've requested that. I think it's important that we know that. What would, what are the costs going to be incurred with the approximately? What is is there going to be any outside costs no. for the city? Your research, your any any work no, added I, on to you? I mean, I would. I've already done the research that I thought I got to that point. Oh. So it's basically yeah, you sorry, reach. You're, you're quite so sorry. Basically, you're reaching out to the attorney yeah, general so where you said. They are interested in, in could take a while for the response. That. in the body I don't I don't know and I'm confused so 
their the attorney general's answer is the Bible. No, it oh. would be persuasive authority. Uh, it's not like a, a court decision, but it is a formal role of the attorney general to provide guidance um, when requested. Uh, it's discretionary when it involves political subunit sub subdivisions like counties and cities. Um, it's not discretionary when requested by a, a state official. Um, and so there's no guarantee that they would do so. But like I said, the, that is that is the role of the attorney general's office and the logic division is to resolve cases, not resolve, <coughs> provide guidance, statewide guidance for issues of law um, that can be uh, set a an interpretation of an area of law or point out for the legislature where there's ambiguity in the law so that if something needs to be resolved by the legislature it can and then uh, that it wouldn't involve more research on my part to do unless you ask me to keep working which I don't think you've asked me to do to date. so we don't know what kind of answer we don't know no, no, what we don't know, I guess. No, and that's, I mean, that was the, the point okay. where I just showed you kind of my thinking, right. showed my math, so to speak. Um, but following up on that, reaching out to the Attorney General. If I could add to the conversation, it's really a question because I know uh, Mr. Scott reached out, in a, I believe, an email to the Attorney General's office, and you did receive some sort of feedback. Uh, and so, what it, is the it, forgive the word is the influence of maybe your position would that maybe solicit a different maybe uh, you know weight in some way? Maybe on, maybe not. I would just say that generally the opinions, and I think even probably the city attorney opinion or the opinion from the 1980s that I referred to. Generally, it's the city attorney reaching out to the AG or the county counselor reaching out to the AG on behalf of the body to say, you know, this is a, a legal question I've looked into. This is where I've got to it thus far with the, I think it's a matter and articulating, I think it's a matter of statewide public policy that would help guide municipal law and to, to be able to say, we formally request that you exercise your discretionary um, role to provide some guidance on it. So I'm not saying that I would have any more influence than Councilman Scott. I'm, just the, I'm saying that's the normal process. So I, I reached out to the Attorney General because there's just so much undecidedness of whether the mayor could veto on that particular uh, vote or not. So their response was, we hope you'll understand as the Chief Legal Officer for the State of Kansas, the Attorney General's Office defends the state and its employees acting in their official capacity against lawsuits. The Attorney General's Office cannot provide legal research, interpretation, or advice regarding legal matters or disputes with other individuals, businesses, or government agencies. While this office <coughs> is prohibited from researching specific statutes and providing legal advice to private individuals, we do not want to provide some resource for you to use. The Kansas statutes are online and available to search, and it gives a, a link here. And it says also you may consider consulting with a private attorney, you, city attorney, uh, for legal assistance. If you do not already have a private attorney, then they're giving you, a, give me a list here. Yeah, that's, I mean, that sounds kind of boilerplate from them yeah. to beg off in the, in the instance that it may, may be interpreted as does the body want this or does, does one, one council elected official want that? This and it doesn't represent the will of the body. Right. And that's why I think what they just said may be true for isolated members of a body, mm -hmm. but it would carry more weight if the if the council itself was asking it through the city attorney or the city manager right. and um, to resolve a question because it is the role of the attorney general to provide guidance. They've done it in the past. They've done it routinely on municipal law. The question is every attorney general's administration probably has a different 
view of its own resources. And so Attorney General Schmidt might have taken certain matters up, whereas Attorney General Kobach would, as far as their logic division of resources available. So I'm not guaranteeing that we would even be able to court interest, but it's my yeah, I think I think for, for me, you know, I think we asked that question, you know, the first time when the veto came out and then there's, I, then you were, you know, you did the research and then the second time, the, the two weeks after veto came back out. And then at that point you said, you're, you're just undecided on what the law says. And so I thought at that point that, cause you said that that's an option versus, you know, going to a district court or whatever, or go to the attorney, attorney general be, you know, no expense. And I thought that's when you would, you, you know, you would do that automatically, but mm -hmm. I emailed them and then 24 hours, I had that response back. I was pretty impressed with their response back, but yeah. uh, I, I think for me, I just, I know the mayor, mayor has that power, mm -hmm. but I just, you know, I've been told by several different legal, uh, you know, counselors, if you will, that not in this case, not on a budgetary, you know, type of, uh, you know, vote that we did, I think, the mayor has the power of veto on ordinances mm -hmm. and not necessarily on the budget because it's not an ordinance, if I understood that correctly. So I think it's just more clarity for us or for me in the future, you know, what, you know, what, you know, what can we expect or not, but. Yeah. And I mean, that's the, and that's just me. That was the point of me providing what I consider to be a little bit more of extensive here, here are the arguments on both ways. And I, if there are other, second opinions, third opinions that would provide the, that type of analysis to say, we know that you're a city a council city for purposes of 12-3003, and this is why that would help the, the process. But it, it seems like, <coughs> at least in my, my experience, as far as resolving these complicated matters where you seem to have two, three, four, or five conflicting statutes, not, in, not to even mention the fact that the ordinance contemplates a veto power that doesn't mention appropriation like 12-3003, that you actually have to do the work and the ju any judge looking at it would have to do the mental work to get through the analysis to say, and this is why. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what I think the Attorney General's office would, would provide versus just kind of knee jerk, well, of course, this statute provides or, or, or that statute provides because I will grant the statutes seem to provide a lot of different conflicting things and that's that's where we found ourselves and I do, I do not as city attorney want to find ourselves in that situation again especially under a time crunch um, where we have to get something passed I want to be able to make sure I provide as much value to you well in advance <coughs> so that you can each one of you can make decisions uh, based on your own elected mandate as far as how to do. So with that, I don't, I don't <coughs> feel like I have guidance. Maybe it's a discussion for another day of, of the body uh, and, and it, me reaching out. I, and I'm not saying I, I or anyone else would get a different answer. It may just be, well, it'd be interesting to know if you, if you reached out to them and and just see if you got a different answer or a complete answer or whatever. I think it would help. It would help me uh, for sure because I mean that I would if I was mayor and I used the veto. I'd want to know if I could legally use it or not. Yeah. You know what I mean? I wouldn't want to. Is there a gray area? I wouldn't want to overuse my power, if you will, uh, or that veto. I know it's there for certain things, but again, what I've been told and advised, not necessarily on a budget. When you're when you're doing the budget, mm -hmm. but only on ordinance and a charter ordinance. And there's an argument. There is an argument. I think I put this in the in the email that that despite what the ordinance says, because it says pursuant to state statute, there are statutes that you could conclude that there's no veto power whatsoever. And so this isn't necessarily limited to budget questions in the future. Now I I would say that that's an that, that is likely not the ultimate case, that, that it seems like there's a clear veto of power, but the, the state legislature has not done you any favors in how they've structured chapter 12, 13, and 14, or chapter 12 and 14. I think we need clarity as a council. <coughs> as you look at other, other 
city councils and I don't I look back and there I mean I've had a hard time finding anybody that vetoed anything um, so I think I think it'd be I think we need clarity agreed agreed or we'll be in this mess again next year yeah, this will happen again we need a clear some kind of a clear answer for this I disagree what do you think Is that a yes? What the hell that was? So it, I'm I'm having a whole lot of trouble understanding. So we've got all these statutes out there that kind of talk different. One says this, one says that. But you're going to ask the attorney general, and that answer is going to be just totally get rid of all the other statutes. Is that? I, I mean, I, I don't even know how I'm asking that because yeah. I just don't understand. No, it's a, it's a, I mean, Regardless it's, of all these statutes, when that attorney the, general sends you a name, that's going to be the answer. Well, we're, that's we're, that's what confuses we're, me. We're, we're, yeah. it, they are not an arbitrator. Um, right. We're not. You're not agreeing to cede your. It's not. You can't even cede your legal question to a, an agreement in, among yourselves. I guess except <coughs> through charter potentially. <laughs> But um, I, th I think it would be, if it's going to be issued and say they were to take it up and they were to issue something in three months or four months or whatever, um, to update or clarify the 1980s, uh, 82, 84 um, opinion, that would not only provide guidance for us, but it would provide guidance for um, for the entire state regarding cities of the second class in a city or a, a mayor, council mayor, manager, former president. And it would also provide clarity with respect to how 12 3003, whether it's universal in applicability or, or, or it's not, um, given the, that phrase in there that for council cities. And so, um, could a council choose to disregard an attorney general opinion? Yes. It is not binding authority. It's uh, persuasive authority. But it would at least provide a little bit of arm's length, which I try, I'm trying to provide. Right. And You're, it's difficult sometimes. To you brought us two or three different because answers. Because you guys disagree with one another, and I'm not, the, I'm not the attorney for any one of you. I'm the attorney for the body, the governing body. Right. And, and so to provide my best read on it, it would at least provide a level up opinion. Um, but you could you can choose to disregard my opinion. I mean, if I were to come out on one side or the other versus the I don't know, which I hate that that's where I ended up, but that's where I ended up because it's it, it's not clear and there is no case law on it. There's no attorney general opinion on it. Um, you could you could have chose to disregard and say, well, we got we got the votes. Let's go forward. Uh, but I think there's value, to answer your question, Councilman Trevor, that I think there's value in the potential for a more uh, statewide resolution of these issues. Because at the very least, the interpretation of KSA 12-3003 and how far it goes in terms of limiting what types of mayor's authorities um, is an open question. What does our, do we have a city ordinance explaining this right now? Yes, it's the a charter powers. ordinance. Mm -hmm. it's, and, and I think you alluded to it, is that uh, it says it's 1.03.005A number six, and it's subsection six. So, so it says the mayor shall have the power to approve or to veto any ordinance as the law of the state shall prescribe. And what our council was telling us is that that's where the ambiguity sets in because what state law, which one, or the absence of one, right? In the sense, is there a prohibition? Is there approval? You know, you, right? What, what is it? So that's where the charter ordinance uh, leaves some ambiguity because when you refer back to the state law, and forgive me if I'm overstepping here, common layperson description here is that. There's not one specific one that absolutely says for absolutely certain 
that this is yes or no. Can you do it? Yes. Can you do it? No. That's where the ambiguity comes in. Therefore, he's expressed this in his statement. He's, he's, his best guidance to you is legal avenues. The attorney general, persuasive but not binding. That those were your options, and they still remain that today. And we do have at least one piece of feedback that says the attorney general doesn't do this kind of work. But you've heard, uh, contrary to that, there may be some weight given because it does come yeah. from a city attorney. But we, the risk is we get the same answer, or we get an answer that we don't like, right? Or we get the answer that we do like. So there's there's these kind of things, you know. I think at this point, I don't know if it's a, I don't think it's a like or dislike. I think it's just more clarity. I mean, the, the vote's there, you know, that we agreed on what we agreed on. I think it's more for the future. And I think, again, for me, and if I was mayor, I would want to know if I'm using a, a tool that was, that I thought was at my resource, can I use it or should I not use it? And if there's, I think for me, if I was, if I didn't know yes or no, I would probably lean about not using it because I wasn't sure if I could use it or not legally. Uh, so I think it, it's just like I said, it's not necessary for a yes or no, just just so we know in the future. Well, it's not on fire tonight. Yeah. Uh, right. In two weeks, if there is a desire to at least task me with that, uh, I, I don't know how that would necessarily work if it needs to be a formal motion if it's not a consensus then um, you know we can take it as it comes but I that I wanted to follow up on that since I suggested that but obviously there we were very tired at the end of last meeting it was very late and so that was probably not on everyone's top okay. I'd like to ask the mayor I mean I think it's up to her I mean would you like to know yes or no if you could use that or not um, or was you advised that you could use it when you did it? I wasn't advised from anyone except for my own research and looking at our ordinances and they said as the state should prescribe and the state didn't say I couldn't. I'll tell you the feedback that I got from the residents and they were very thankful that someone was looking out for them and speaking up for them. And so a um, little uh, past precedent is every year before this, at least 10 years back in the minutes, the mayor actually had a vote on the budget. And, and what we're talking about now says the person, the highest elected official in the city would have zero say in the budget, which is one of the most important things <coughs> we vote on as a governing body. And I don't think that's appropriate to say the highest elected official in the city has zero say on the budget. So um, I can tell you where I stand on it. I think that it's appropriate for the mayor to have some sort of say in this, whether it's a veto or a vote. I can tell you where the residents stand on it and, and residents feel free to Feel free to uh, tell me if there's another opinion, but um, every single resident that I spoke to after that was very thankful uh, for for the veto at that particular vote, just to have us reconsider and try to work together a little bit further as a as a group and and find some consensus on that. Um, I think that you've given us something to think about. Maybe we'll we'll discuss and and come back to you um, if if it's not urgent to decide today. Um, and then if uh, we want to move forward any particular direction, we can discuss that. I disagree. I think we should ask for an attorney general's opinion on it. The sooner the better. I think the mayor overstepped her authority. I don't remember the mayor's voting for the budgets. I remember the mayor's recommending budgets. I think that, that there was so much discussion on the budget. I think three people finally relented somewhat. I know two people barely relented on the budget. I think it's more important issue than that. I think we need an opinion. We're talking about money, money, money on streets and projects and how we're going to finance them. We're trying to build city facilities. If you build streets and you don't have curbs and gutters, you're going to have to have employees to clean the ditches out and keep the streets up. I don't think that I think that this needs to be solved as soon as possible. I think we need to, I'd like to make a motion to request the attorney to request the attorney general an opinion on this subject. Would that technically be amending the agenda? I, I don't I care what you got to do. I just think we need to do it. I've, However you need to amend the agenda or whatever. I have a question. Sorry. Is that true that the mayor was 
able to vote for the last 10 years on the budget? Well, I don't recall. The mayor was called on, especially planning and zoning, if I recall right. Uh -huh. uh, we'd have to just, I, I would trust that she's done her, mayor, that you've done your research yeah, and that there was, there was some vote. <coughs> uh, I know during transition, and mayor, you can confirm this or not, that there was some discussion. We wanted a legal opinion as to the, I, I guess, not the veto, but the vote or the authority of the mayor and that there was that we could look back to precedence, something we were already doing in practice. If we had it in our ordinance, if I recall right, and I think that this is some research you did, uh, and that, or that some of these were defined maybe by statute and the ordinance. Uh, we, we figured out that, hey, some of this we were doing wrong. That's as simple as I can put it. I, have, I haven't found that particular document to say these were absolute. I know there were some email exchanges from the previous administration to say, we're, we're defining this, but there was a past practice that involved the mayor to vote. I just can't say what specific categories. I would be interested in, to know that because then I would want to know well, why, you know, did it stop? Well, uh, it's planning zoning is a different function of right. the board. It's right. a it's a quasi judicial function in which you're you have a law already set, your planning code, and then you have an application, and so you're sitting as an adjudicator. You're you are determining whether the application for use of the land or a variance in that use in the land is meets with the code and you can and so if you were to be sued on that uh, it would because it would be within you acting as a quasi judicial uh, body and there's very limited basis for challenging that um, the legislative function of passing a a budget um, is is different and that's why we found ourselves back into well what's who votes on it a and b does the mayor have the ability to to veto it so i didn't mean to open up old wounds so to speak but at the same time i i at least wanted to be able to articulate that to me the the rule of law even in edwardsville kansas <clears throat> is ultimately what is going to provide not only you but the, the citizens with the most certainty uh, in the future and it's my job to, to <coughs> shepherd, safeguard that law and I think that it, it would be something of a constitutional crisis if the council believed it had passed one ordinance and uh, the mayor believed she vetoed that same ordinance without a, a a veto proof majority of the council that was the constitutional crisis that i was trying to or in this case ordinance crisis <laughs> where it, i was trying to articulate last time which you were able to avert because there was consensus on a, a budget um, and so i mention it solely to say that i i want you to continue to view me as a resource for the entire body and sometimes that can mean drafting competing proposals of the same policy, meaning as a resource for you all to be able to debate and deliberate um, each each uh, meeting um, and to give you the options when there is a severe disagreement. And one of the options I at least found this time is that I do think it's a significant amount, uh, enough public importance of statewide concern that if the attorney general or someone in the attorney general's office is trying to beg off that they should have a, the best case made for for taking the case so to speak well i just believe excuse me if i would just believe though if we should have clarity in this matter because i don't ever remember tiny voting on the, any budgets when you know, when I was around before or watching them. But I think it, clarity will be give us transparency. And that's that's very rare in government. Mayor, a couple of things. If I recall, I want to do the research for sure. I think there was an interpretation of what the governing body vote was. So it's a vote of the governing body. So, for example, planning and zoning. Charter ordinances are a specific example where the entire body has a vote. The mayor cannot veto in which they would have the vote. Right? So, so that, that's what I 
that's one piece of it. The so we'll have to research. I think we just have to go back and I know we have some some legal documentation on to answer the question is why. The next piece is governance. And the question that you posed is whether or not a motion was made and that would change the agenda in some way. The resolution that we passed, I think, had an intent to address these things because they're a matter of public concern and they're not on the published agenda. And there was a motion made as to direct the city attorney to then go and contact the attorney general uh, to solicit the option of an opinion from them about this particular matter. So there is a motion, uh, there's not been a second, and it would take four or five votes to put this on the agenda and or move it to a different agenda, like the next week. So far as, as far as the resolution that we passed this particular year, it takes four or five to add something to the agenda. Because of that public matter of public concern, it wasn't published, public didn't get to see or hear the material uh, unless they're watching now but maybe if it had been published that's the intent if it had been published, they could then come and hear personally the matter of concern I will rescind the motion and ask the mayor to put that on the next agenda I mean, does it have to be on the agenda to just uh, yes it? Attorney to get it I guess. looked at, or? Yeah, I got much power up here. I mean, he's just here. It's totally up to you. I just to answer the question that was posed. Oh, we do. I, mean, he just I think the question that I have is the, I believe, and I don't want to misinterpret, is that the concern is regarding a veto on a budget. When is the next time we're voting on a budget? Well, it could be the next ordinance that comes up. Well, that we could be stalemated on. I mean, you know, this is something that's going to accelerate. I can guarantee you this is going to accelerate. So this, I would request that this item be put on the agenda <coughs> for the next meeting. But the question wasn't about the veto regarding ordinance. It's a veto regarding the budget. And so what I'm, what I'm saying is it might be all right to sit and consider. I don't set the agenda at this meeting or the next one. That's something I can take under consideration um, in moving forward in, in considering for the next meeting. Any other? <laughs> no, I, that in the legal profession, we call that inviting error. Yes. Where in my city attorney comments, address something that I think that is is a, a follow-up and open question I was not trying to force yet another disagreement on what the legal uh, what, whether you can do it tonight whether you can do it next time all that I, I do think that it's in the city's best interest to resolve it before it becomes an issue again and um, so do you feel like we need a vote or do you feel like you can no, just move forward? No, I. Um, with it, I mean, is that what you're, with, if you feel like Without a consensus, like, at okay. least one council member saying no, um, it's not a consensus. You can direct me by consensus to, to do that. I would probably say at some point you would need to direct me to do it. Otherwise, I'm not speaking on behalf of the body if I were to reach out. So. I see. Uh, maybe just. Let's let it sit so we can. I think we just weren't quite prepared for it. And so maybe coming back, we could have more of an agreement um, into which way to best move forward. And the other option is at some point I can actually, if you wanted me to write out the exact request that would be provided to the Attorney General office in letter form um, for you to consider that question um, so it's a more formal deliberation on whether that's some value but I also don't want to go down rabbit holes that you guys don't want me to go down so I think I think that I there's three of us Mark I don't want to for you but I think Mark Garrett myself we just like clarity on it and I think yeah it would, we are talking about you know what happened on the budget but I think I think for me though I, I'd like clarity you know if there is another veto in the near future 
it'd be nice if we had this cleared up and then clarity on whether you could or couldn't veto a, you know a three five vote in the future because I mean for me I you know I, I, I've heard of the veto I you know I don't know the law on it before this happened so I tried to educate myself as much as I could but I think for me having a, a, a council you know we're all different in, in our backgrounds and our expertise, you know, and of different things and having the opinion of, of five different people. And then we had a majority vote of three, five, and then the veto came, you know, it's only, it's basically took away our opinions. And so why do we have a council <coughs> if we can't speak our mind or give our, our best opinions for the, you know, the, the direction of our city or future. And I know that, you know, that's the mayor's job is, you know, the number one with the city manager, but, you know, just that the veto was, you know, it just didn't feel good for me personally, you know, and it, it just, and I tried not to take it personal, but it was, it was difficult for me to, just because I know we have a voice, we all have an opinion. So I think it just, it would help me get past all that, you know, feelings, if you will, if we could have clarity for the future, because I'm, there's, you know, I've talked to several people that I really respect that are way smarter than me and said that, you know, that that veto shouldn't have been allowed for that that particular case. So I, you know, if the veto is allowed in other cases, I'd like to know that too. That way I don't have to worry about it, right? If it's veto happened, it happens. But um, I think it just clarity would help, you know, because I don't want any animals, you know, I, especially up here. You know, again, I, I respect everybody up here and their opinions. I respect what the mayor is trying to do, but I think just for me, it'd be better. It'd be it'd be good to know what that what that law is. So and I think my question would be just and and respectfully, like I'm not trying to be contentious or, or anything along those lines, but just to explain a little bit of of this seat is is you want everyone to have a voice up here, but I would ask, where is mine? Uh, where would my voice be? Well, I think your your voice is entrusting that we all have the right information and make the best best decision for our city so i have zero vote I, yeah, like I'm, I'm asking because you're saying you well, want i think everyone that's the way it's set up, a right? voice up here that's why the mayor has the veto though is because i don't have a vote there's there's a few things that the mayor has and if i i would ask why in the world would anyone want to be the mayor like why wouldn't i just run for council you know if if i have zero vote as the mayor i have zero voice in in the budget beforehand and so the uh, as the highest elected official, if I have zero vote and no veto, if you want everyone to have a voice up here, that would mean everyone but me would have. Yeah, that, that debate's not with me. I think that's with the law. I mean, with the, with the stat, state statute. Yeah, and and the state statutes have reached more absurd results than that in the past in terms of what it feels like should be the case municipal law in Kansas especially since the 70s with home rule has it, it's the wild west sometimes yeah. unfortunately and what feels like should be the case because we're used to news about the federal model of the of the vice president serving as the tie-breaking vote in a divided senate <clears throat> or the president having the ability to veto uh, bills um, all of those things aren't necessarily the same across the board. And I would say that rules and, and, and procedure uh, exist to allow for deliberation mm -hmm. and whose voice gets counted in at what processes and at what points of procedure is always potentially an open question because of the amount of flexibility that Kansas law allows for cities of the second class, first class, et cetera, constitutionally and statutorily. So they can lead to results or open questions that feel absurd, whether from the perspective of, of a council person or the perspective from a mayor. And so if there is a way to, a way forward to to exercise home uh, governance like you did last time, which is we don't know and we don't want to be put in this position. We will actually want to deliberate over the policy versus bone-on-bone -bone proceduralism. 
that, that was kind of where I ended up with that um, because a knee jerk, well, yeah, the mayor has voted veto power or no, the mayor doesn't have veto power without showing the math doesn't help with the public trust either. And for the people that have provided you with those answers, I welcome, welcome. Show me, I'd love to see their math. Yeah. Because my opinion could change uh, based on, well, here's the clear I know, biting air. Uh, I don't want to get a dispute about whether you can amend the agenda at this point, four votes, three votes, five votes, whatever it is. Like, it's it's fine, but I do think it's an open question. The other thing I would, I 